everyone. I'm Dr. Angela Puka and welcome to my symposium. I'm a PhD and a religious studies scholar, and this is your online resource for the academic study of magic, historicism, paganism, shamanism, witchcraft, and all things occult. If you're familiar with my content, you will know that usually I have content based on peer-reviewed material, or I have interviews with other academics, professors, and uh, other PhD researchers. But I have started a new series where I also interview practitioners. And so this series is kind of um, academic and practitioner in conversation. And it is shaped similarly to how I conduct my interviews with my informants when I do anthropological research, with the exception that, of course, I interact much more. Usually, I would interact much less than I do in these kind of interviews. But I thought it would be also interesting for you to see an academic and a practitioner in conversation. And today we have a special guest, Chaotic Witch Ant, and we will allow them to introduce themselves. So help me in welcoming Frankie Ann to the symposium. Hello, Frankie. How are you today? Thank you so much for accepting the invitation to be on Angela's symposium. First I am doing very well. I'm very happy to be here. <laughs> and um, so for those of you who don't know you, uh, would you mind introducing yourself and let us know anything that you feel comfortable uh, sharing about your, your background? Yeah, my name is Frankie. Um, I'm most commonly known by the name Chaotic Witchant. I make content on TikTok, on YouTube, and on Instagram uh, pertaining to witchcraft, as well as that I am an Italian-American folk practitioner, a practitioner of folk magic. And yeah, I've also authored a book in the past called Spells for Change. And I think that's about everything that is important about me. <laughs> and what is your book about? Um, I wrote it as a kind of a beginner's manual for starting witchcraft. Um, so if you're looking within the realm of Italian folk magic, you won't find a lot in there. But if you are someone who is interested in witchcraft and starting it from kind of a no tradition, no religion point of view and looking for something that you can format to your own practice, Spells for Change is a great book to get started with. Mm. So that makes me wonder, what is your definition of witchcraft now? <laughs> Ooh, I, that's a good question. I would love to answer that. Yeah, um, gone. My question, my definition of witchcraft, I think, is ever-changing. It's very different now than it was at the beginning. Um, and it's more formatted by the historical perception of witchcraft. Um, the term of a witch kind of has always been and always had a negative connotation. So I see witchcraft um, as the craft of those who are othered. Um, whether that is by way of identity, by way of religion, or um, by way of really anything. Um, I also think witchcraft is inherently activism because, I, I know, I saw your, I saw your head tilt. <laughs> um, I think witchcraft is inherently activism, and that is because witchcraft historically has always been posed against oppressors, um, even when in kind of like later contexts. Um, but in a very basic way, witchcraft is using spells to get the outcome you desire. Once we get past that kind of baseline, my opinion or my like unverified gnosis of witchcraft starts coming in. Um, but yeah. Mm. Um, yeah, the, um, uh, I, you know, my reaction when <laughs> you, you said that uh, you feel that um, you think that witchcraft is inherently, what was the term that you used again? Activism. Activism. Uh, yeah, I think that that's very linked to the history of witchcraft in the US, especially from yes. the 1950s. Oh, yeah. Um, so because especially the history of how Wicca was received in the US. Mm -hmm was I extremely linked to the gay and feminist liberation movements, and then yep. it became strictly linked to activism. I think that is different in, in Europe in the way witchcraft has been perceived. But I think that it makes sense to make an argument for linking the two in terms of, uh, as you said, witchcraft has been used quite often since antiquity as a term of mm -hmm. othering. This is something that I also wrote a chapter in a 
peer-reviewed edited book uh, that yeah. has just come up lately about and I talk about the conceptualization of magic as mm -hmm. a way of othering so um, it is something that I also found as an academic in my research uh, but yeah I find it interesting uh, your your definition and um, now I'd like you to tell my audience because they might not be familiar with, with uh, that expression, although I know what you mean, but, mm -hmm. um, I think that my, my audience is perhaps m more interested in, I wouldn't say in ceremonial magic, but, um, perhaps in the theoretical aspects of, yeah. of witchcraft, ceremonial magic and, um, similar kind of topics. So, um, would you mind elaborating more on the, um, term unverified personal gnosis oh of course so unverified personal gnosis is a very fancy way of saying your opinion um and there's you know unverified personal gnosis shared personal gnosis the idea is that unverified personal gnosis is categorized by your experiences or your quote unquote gnosis. Um, and it can then reflect the way that you conduct your magic or your witchcraft. So for example, my unverified personal gnosis is that St. Mary and Diana are two sides of the same coin, that they were syncretized throughout um, history. But another practitioner may not agree with that whatsoever. However, I conduct most of my practice through this idea that St. Mary and Diana are similar or two sides of the same coin. I hope that makes sense. Mm. So it is more based on your personal experience as opposed to, for instance, history or um, mm -hmm. something yeah. that is linked to a specific tradition or linked to a specific historical development. Yes, you can have a UPG or an unverified personal gnosis that has historical backing. Um, a lot of times when I'm looking at my um, unverified personal gnosis or formulating my opinions, I tend to do a lot of research about it because I, I know it sounds weird, but I don't like being historically inaccurate. I don't like taking something and saying, well, this is my experience and that means it's, you know, true. And I did find some historic some like historical representation of diana and saint mary being syncretized with a specific apparition of mary um but past that you know i've seen people with unverified personal gnosis that you know very much lean into the unverified part i try to lean in more with the like verified personal gnosis of this is you know has historical backing um, I say unverified in regards to St. Mary and Diana because the research is so shaky and it's me conducting my own research without a methodology and coming to a conclusion. Um, if I was going to go for verified, I'd have to take the approach of probably an anthropology paper, a sociology paper, and very much conduct something analytically with a uh, hypothesis, set format, everything. Mm. Yeah, perhaps in that specific case, it would be more a case of uh, studying the history of religion, Yeah, um, considering the, the kind of syncretism that may or may not have occurred. So would you say that um, if you have a certain experience, an unverified personal gnosis, a spiritual experience of uh, a specific sort, and then you realize or uh, find out that it is not historically accurate, will it change or affect your experience in any way? I think for me personally, yes. If I have an experience or have a belief and let's say it's not necessarily like a spiritual belief, but a belief that similarly using my past example, St. Mary and Diana are syncretized. If I can't or am unable to find anything on that syncretization, on anything occurring throughout history, I may feel more, I may lean away from that belief, possibly because it makes me uncomfortable when I am sitting here saying, this is my experience, but no one else throughout history has had the same experience as me or the same opinion. And a lot of synchronization too is, you can typically find some historical back, some historical information on it throughout um, 
different journals, different uh, research papers. And without that, it's difficult for me to continue leaning on a belief. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I'm interested in that also as a researcher, you know, how contemporary practitioners um, are constructing their beliefs and how important, for instance, either history or religious studies more generally, because, you know, there Mm -hmm. are different fields studying religion. There's history of religion, sociology of religion that focuses more on the impact on society and anthropology of religion, like I do um, mostly, Mm -hmm. that, that focuses on how uh, people in the contemporary world, in the modern world, construct their beliefs and what their what their practices look like. And mm-hmm. it is a study of the contemporary world and how um, worldviews are constructed, meaning is made um, as part of the, the practice of witchcraft. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, that is interesting for me to, you know, to get input from, yeah. <laughs> you know, from, from people, from practitioners, even to better understand what's going on in the in the field mm-hmm. <laughs> but um, now let's move on to the um, topic that will be the 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 main <laughs> the main topic perhaps <laughs> of this interview so and that's one of the reasons why we call each other's attention perhaps I think <laughs> um, I know that you are an American with Italian heritage mm-hmm. and as you may know I have extensively studied Italian witchcraft for my uh, PhD and uh, beyond my PhD. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I was the first scholar, the first anthropologist to ever have conducted, um, that has ever conducted a systematic study of Italian witchcraft as Italian witchcraft across the Italian peninsula. Mm -hmm. Uh, Whereas uh, previous researchers have focused on specific regions or specific specific manifestations of that but we will mm-hmm. talk more about that uh, in the interview that you will do to me <laughs> on your <laughs> youtube channel but um what i'm interested in is that since you are an american that is trying to reconnect with your uh, italian heritage uh, do you think that there is a difference between italian and italian american witchcraft i do think that there is a difference And the reason I say that is based on my understanding of folk magic. Folk magic is a magic of the people and the culture and the people within America versus within Italy is so different that it's impossible to say that they are the same. As well as that we have within kind of the Italian American folk magic, a mix of people, some who grew up with grandmothers teaching them the tradition, some like me who are trying to reconnect, but all of which um, are parents of immigrants uh, who came from Italy uh, 50 years ago, 30 years ago, however many years ago, some more recently, some further away. And because of not only the not only the changes that have to happen in order for someone to assimilate into the U.S. and as immigrants, but also the way that the needs of people who are American um, and the needs of people, even in the Western world, even in like Canada, I would say that Canada and America are not 100% similar. But when I talk to Italian Canadian Um, individuals and folk practitioners, we have more similarities than Italian-Australian, which I have talked to uh, Italian-Australian as well, and it's completely different than Italian-American. But within kind of uh, America, the needs of the people of the folk have changed so drastically from a lot of the information that um, our grandparents have, that our great-grandparents have, that it's impossible to say that they are the same. Um, Folk magic is and always will be survival of the people and what the people need to survive. And 50 years ago in Italy, that was making sure your breast milk wasn't stolen. But now in America, it's, okay, our government isn't doing so great. So what kind of magic or what kind of services can we provide to the people as folk witches, as folk practitioners? Does that make sense? Mm. Yeah. And perhaps do you think that it is also linked to the Italian-American culture as opposed to the Italian culture? 
I think yes. Do, do you think there is an? Do you do you think that there is an Italian American culture? Now that I think <laughs> about it, um, is it like a I, subculture? <laughs> subculture in the U.S. There's, uh, hmm. so I wasn't raised particularly within a pocket of Italian Americans, and I think where there are pockets of Italian Americans there is a more present Italian-American culture. Mm. Um, things that I know to be, you know, present in Italian-American culture that I get asked about are like sauce day, where you make sauce on Sundays. Um, that's one example. But within those kind of pockets, I think it is more present. I think that depending on where you are, you're going to have more... Um, more presence of Italian Americans in general. Um, I would say that the East Coast, so New York, Philadelphia, has a very large presence of Italian Americans. I'm in Colorado, and I wear um, the cornichello my, from my grandma. And I've been told at least five times people look at me and they're like, "I haven't seen one of those in ages." And I'm like, "What do you mean? Is it like people stop wearing them, or there's just no Italian Americans here?" Um, and so, in certain areas of the U.S there's not a lot of Italian Americans or Italian American community. Within New York and Pennsylvania, Philadelphia, um, that's different. I met, I met so many people who were Italian American when I was in Massachusetts as well, or in Connecticut. Um, as for saying <laughs> in Italian American culture, I think that since culture is continually changing and thriving, there are traditions or rituals or ideas or beliefs that are present within Italian American populations. I don't know if I would, I, culture is such an inter interesting word because in America, culture is very much associated with um, those who are black, who are people of color. Culture isn't for white people in America. Um, and I say that as white people who have forfeited their culture by way of immigration or assimilation. So within that context, Italian American people do have culture. I'm just unsure of what it looks like because I was raised in an Italian American family. However, that kind of changed as I got older. We definitely had things like uh, the Feast of the Seven Fishes. That's a purely Italian American thing. I know I can see your face. It is. Uh, <laughs> I've never, I can understand the the sauce Sunday or the sauce day, and um, yeah, you know, um, because it is something that is we don't have a sauce day in <laughs> in Italy, but I can see the the connection because in the south, especially in certain regions of the south, mm -hmm. uh, during uh, Sunday, uh, usually especially um in the past so i'm trying to connect things because yeah. most of the italians that immigrated to the u.s uh did so i think in the early 20th century before yes. the second world war or yep. right after the second world war uh so during sunday in certain southern regions they would uh, cook the um, something called ragu which is a, a specific kind of sauce and basically would say you know piping for hours and hours so that is mm -hmm. a, a traditional thing but we don't really have so stay but i can see the connection yeah. whereas with the seven fish thing i have no oh, yeah that's anything that could... <laughs> feast of the seven fishes is a purely italian american tradition where on christmas eve you get together with your family and you prepare seven dishes of fish to oh. eat so I, when I was young, we would go to Christmas Eve dinner with my family who was Italian American and we would have uh, like a huge Christmas Eve dinner. Um, the cr Christmas is still within Italian American, especially those who are Catholic. Christmas is still a very big thing. Um, Christmas Eve has importance and that's kind of marked by the Feast of the Seven Fishes as an important uh, holiday. Christmas as well, still important. What we don't have, and this is, I guess, um, the more Catholic families may have this, but the epiphany is something that is also not translated as much over into Italian-American, at least in my family. And I, of course, I'm speaking from 
one family in a huge country where everyone has had different experiences. Um, So it's difficult for me to say for sure, this is a thing, this is not a thing, because although I grew up with an Italian American family, and my mom's left the Catholic church, I haven't seen that side of the family in years. And it kind of becomes... It, it, it's more separate, I think, for me than it is to others. Yeah, I get it. In Italy, there is the tradition to eat fish on, uh, yeah, on Christmas Eve because mm-hmm. there's this big dinner on Christmas Eve and usually uh, people eat fish. But this one specific fish is not seven different types. <laughs> so Seven fishes, seven. We get, uh, my mom always makes uh, calamari, which is the little squids oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. on Christmas Eve. Oh, yeah, Eve. we do that too. We do that yeah. too in, in Italy. And, um, uh, yeah, let me count. Maybe it is seven. I've never heard <laughs> of the specific thing of seven fishes, but there is a lot of fish at Christmas uh, dinner. Um, yeah, like there's the... Um, the, the fried the fried fish and mm-hmm. uh, and then as the because in in Italy we have the first course the first course the second uh, mm-hmm. but no I don't think it's seven we haven't been able to make seven for a while because it's just my mom my dad and like the rest of like my immediate family cooking so we just go for uh, spaghetti and calamari and that's our Christmas mm-hmm. Eve it's the only time of year where we all get to like eat calamari which is great. Um, But yeah, I'm trying to think of anything else. Sometimes I've heard, you know, eating lentils on New Year's Eve to bring good luck. Yeah, we Um, do that in Italy. And and that's usually linked to prosperity. Yeah, yeah, to bring prosperity. Yeah, yeah, this is an Italian thing. So some Uh, things are like Italian that trickled down and Mm -hmm. some things are purely Italian-American. So it's hard for me to say... Oh, it's a, it's a, it's pieces of Italian culture mixed with things that were purely Italian American, like chicken Parmesan was something that Italian Americans came up with. <laughs> like I, yeah, it's delicious, but it's not actually Italian. No. Um, and if you come to Italy uh, and ask for pepperoni pizza or chicken Alfredo or spaghetti and meatball, people will look at you, <laughs> you know, very confused. <laughs> well, if you, ask for, if you ask for pe- pepperoni pizza in, in Italy, you would very likely get a pizza with peppers on <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's funny. what you would get because pepperoni yeah. in Italian is the um, the vegetable, you know, yeah. the pepper. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But I think that um, since I I'm divulging my research mainly in English, I've also published in a peer-reviewed journal in Italian, which was great, so that my mm-hmm. research could also be accessed by you know by Italians. But uh, since my research. Uh, and my my talks and at conferences i mainly speak in english because i'm working for a university here in the uk mm-hmm. i get a lot of attention from italian americans yeah and um I never studied as a researcher, as an academic, Italian American witchcraft per se, or the mm-hmm. perception that Italian Americans have of Italian witchcraft. Yeah. However, um, you know, I got interested into that because so many Italian Americans have reached out either mm-hmm. because they are interested in reconnecting with their Italian heritage or because they have very specific ideas or they seem to think that they know what Italian witchcraft is, uh, which is something that I find fascinating since, you know, it, it, you know, even for Italians, it's quite mm-hmm. difficult to figure out. And it is a, a process that it is still mm-hmm. ongoing. But again, we will talk about that on your channel. Um, but yeah, I think that my interest is, what do you think is the perception that Italian Americans have of Italian witchcraft? Do you think, you know, if in case there are some main... Um, traditions or some main mm-hmm. ideas that Italian Americans have uh, regarding what Italian witchcraft is. I know about Stregheria and Grimassi, but and I have a video on that, <laughs> so people know what I 
um, oh. what my my take and the take of other scholars is because I never present my t- you know only my take but um, mm-hmm. that what the research actually says uh, but um, other than that but also you can include that what are the main ideas that Italian Americans have when it comes to Italian witchcraft what do they think Italian witchcraft is so I'm gonna split this into kind of three groups there are the people who believe that the Gramasi tradition is accurate um, and is what Italian witchcraft either like doesn't necessarily look like now but looked like ages ago and it's being revived by Gramasi and the Gramasi tradition there are people like me who I think are reconstructing and reconnecting with Italian heritage and are paying attention to the folk Catholic elements of it, the syncretization of it, as well as um, the kind of healing aspects of it and using papers like yours and papers like Sabina Magliocco, anthropology papers to reconnect um, and look at tradition and then taking that tradition and reconstructing it within a contemporary like modern way. Um, And then I think there are plenty of people who do not consider what they do witchcraft whatsoever that were raised in Italian folk magic by way of grandparents, by way of um, mothers, by way of great grandparents that they just are continuing to pass the tradition down and they consider themselves good Catholic Italian Americans. Um, and within that kind of sphere, because I definitely, I know of a few people who were raised in this tradition and then started moving towards witchcraft as a term and witchcraft as an idea. Um, but I think there are definitely people who are not on the internet, who will never see this video, who are doing Italian American folk magic every day and never think of it as witchcraft. Um And they just know this is what their grandma did in the old country. They just know this is what my great grandma taught me and she is Italian. So this is Italian folk magic. Um, And so within those three pockets, we have kind of one that's completely historically inaccurate, which is Gramasi. And then we have two that are doing their best with the information that is given to them, either passed down orally um, or the information that is available through other Italian American folk practitioners, through community, as well as through research to kind of take what they can and bring it back into their lives. Mm. Yeah, that seems to be a very very good way of explaining the different uh, perceptions. So apart from Grimassi, do you Mm -hmm. think that there is any other... um, any other uh, person or any other, um, I don't want to use the word guru. Why is the word that is coming to mind? You know, any other person that claims to know what Italian witchcraft is, a book that has been particular, particularly influential um, or any other tradition apart from the other two um, classifications that you've given me that are more based, as you said, on uh, heritage and uh, research, both uh, personal and research on on papers? That's a good question. None come to the top, like off the top of my head. We have, of course, kind of Charles Leland, who wrote the Aradia, um, and he very much influenced Gramasi's work. So Leland is another one that the Aradia is very popular. It's become folkloric in origin, meaning like people have started centering religions, beliefs, practices around it, giving a certain element of, I mean, my friend who is a folklorist always says with folklore, it doesn't matter if it's true or not. It just matters if people believe in it. Um, And since people believe in the Aradia, it's become a folkloric text, even though the historical accuracy of it is highly debated. Um, you're just shaking your head. <laughs> yes. Um, yes, because by debated, we can we can say quite openly that there is no historical evidence whatsoever that nice. Leland said. Um, because there are no reports. I mean, if you look at the uh, Italian ethnography of the of the time or around mm-hmm. the time, there is nothing that resembles in any way what Leland said. So either yeah. 
he actually met Maddalena and it was a personal experience and a, and a personal tradition that had nothing to do with Italian witchcraft yeah. or he just made it up. <laughs> so <laughs> if, if we want to be very generous towards him, it could be that he that what he says actually happened, but it is still not, um, it doesn't reflect what mm-hmm. was happening in Italy at the time because there yeah. is no other ethnographic report or historical evidence that mm-hmm. anything of that sort was going on. Yeah. Um, and that was, um, yeah, it was in Tuscany that he was. Yeah. yeah. So Which no. within that, I know of people who say that their grandma taught them the witchcraft that came from the Aradia and that it was in, within a family. And I'm like, okay, cool. Um, I'm not here to debate what your family does. I am, however, going to start telling people that Leland is historically inaccurate because I have been saying highly debated for so long, and I'm very happy that I can say historically inaccurate though now. <laughs> um, but within that, Gramasi is definitely the big one, um, so much so that I actually had a conversation with another friend, another content creator, an American witch who is Irish-American, um, because I said... This person, someone asked me for resources on Stregaria. And I said, that's not my, that's not what I study. I'm not going to be able to provide you with a lot in that area. And my friend was like, wait, I'm confused. I thought Stregaria was the term for Italian witchcraft. And I go, okay, hold on. And I rattle off, this is what Stregaria is. It's been used for ages, but it's not historically accurate. No one in Italy actually uses it. Italian American folk practitioners, for the most part, don't really use it. They would use terms like stregoneria or benedicaria, and benedicaria is a newer term um, in, coined by Augustino Tomatardro mm-hmm. um, to describe the folk Catholic practices of Italian American and Italian folk magic. Um, but I had to explain this to someone because for the past however long it's been since Gramasi published Italian witchcraft, the majority of people within the witchcraft community have just seen Stregeria and immediately said that is Italian witchcraft. Um, And that's the, that is the, I will say that is the damage Gramasi has done because when I first started looking into what my family did, um, I read Italian Witchcraft by Gramasi and my mom looks at it and she goes, your grandma, this is not us. This, we never did anything like this. This is not like anything like this. I picked up another book called Italian Folk Magic by Mary Grace Farren. I read it. I gave it, I read things out to my mother. My mom goes, yeah, I remember your grandma doing that. I remember my grandma doing this. I remember all of these things that this seems more accurate to what our family did. So even within the Italian American sphere and the reconstructionist sphere, if you're actually looking at what your family did and what was carried over um, with immigration, you're not gonna find anything resembling Gramasi. Um, and it's uh, uh, it's if someone who is Italian American oh, wants how shocking. to- I, <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> no, it's okay. Um, if someone wants to go into the Gramasi tradition as a new tradition, as an Italian American, that is their prerogative. That is their choice. I understand that because it's more pagan and packaged as more pagan, more more neo pagan, I will say, than what we actually see, which is folk Catholicism blended with kind of older beliefs and older healing methods then that's their choice. I'm not going to stop them from doing that, but it is not and never will be Italian folk magic or Italian American folk magic. Mm. Yeah, that makes sense. And it is something that I also mentioned uh, other uh, on other occasions on my channel. And as you said, there is a difference when you mentioned your uh, friend who's a folklorist and he said mm-hmm. that in folklore it doesn't matter if something is historically accurate what matters is that people do that yeah. and uh, that is a different perspective on a specific phenomenon for, uh, on a specific religious phenomenon absolutely so um the the problem well as an academic what i'm concerned with is accuracy of knowledge yes so um 
the problem is not that there are people that um, practice tregeria and find mm -hmm. meaning and purpose and uh, it enriches their lives. The problem comes for me as an academic when there is a claim, as Grimassi did, uh, because I, I mentioned this before on my channel, but I, I actually... I participated, I was present when he was arguing with actual Italians who can speak Italian and have, were, were born and raised in Italy. And he mm -hmm. was arguing on what Italian witchcraft was and that he, he was claiming that his tradition was authentic Italian witchcraft. So in that case, for me as a scholar, uh, there's a problem of inaccuracy. Mm -hmm. So one thing is to say, I follow this tradition called stregeria, a term that in, in Italian doesn't exist. Mm -hmm. uh, I, um, I follow this tradition, it enriches my life, it um, makes me feel in connection with the spirits, with the spiritual world, with yeah. nature, whatever it is that you're trying to achieve with your religious and spiritual practice. That is one thing. Mm -hmm. The other thing is saying, I'm practicing practicing this tradition and this is the authentic Italian yes. witchcraft. So yes. these two are very different statements and are very different ways of, mm -hmm. you know, talking about what it is that you're doing. Uh, so in a way, the, the concept of unverified personal gnosis is um, perhaps is helpful in that sense. You know, when people want to say, I had this experience, it was mm -hmm. extremely important to me. However, I have no idea or I have even confirmed the fact that it's not historically accurate. But yeah. uh, so I'd say that an anthropologist or a folklorist wouldn't debate the validity of someone's spiritual or religious experience. Absolutely mm -hmm. not. Um, the problem is the accuracy when there is a claim associated with that experience that goes beyond the personal experience and enters the realm of culture, of mm -hmm. history, and of um, the religious development of a specific tradition. In that mm -hmm. case, a scholar would say, well, <laughs> there is no evidence of that. So uh, that's the that's the issue. But I always say, since I, as an anthropologist, I start, you know, I um, get my hands dirty and I participate in rituals and I, I stay with practitioners. So I know how important things, you know, practices are to people. So I would mm -hmm. never, you know, try to insult or denigrate anyone's experience mm -hmm. so that's why i always premise i have nothing against people that find um, any spiritual religious benefit from practicing mm -hmm. stregeria it is just that as a scholar who has studied italian witchcraft i can confirm that you know there is no evidence or grounds to say that that is the authentic italian witchcraft it is a, mm -hmm. a new religious movement yeah, so that's the the matter. But I always, you know, want to uh, be empathetic towards practitioners. That's my point. I, I do agree with you too. I think the issue is when someone says this is the authentic Italian witchcraft, and it's not historically accurate. And I think Gramasi saying that has caused the ripple effect of everyone thinking that Sergeria is historically accurate, or at least is what Italian witches do. Um, and that's my kind of problem as well, is within kind of my reconnection and bringing back certain traditions into my life that my great grandparents did, that my grandma did, and seeing someone still read Gramasi's work. It's difficult for me and reading Ramasi, like you said, is not a big deal if that's the personal gnosis is that it enriches their life. But for someone to say that Gramasi is still historically accurate, that is the problem in and of itself. Yeah. Um, also, um, I, I know that you touched on it a bit earlier, but I was wondering uh, what is your the methodology that you use to inform and construct your practice? Do you base it on sources? Sources? your direct experience, um, a mix of both? Do you give more important to, do you give more importance to one as opposed to the other? I'm just curious to know how you inform your practice as a practitioner of Italian American witchcraft, folk witchcraft. Folk witchcraft. So um, a great question. Uh, I would say it's a mix of both, although I do tend to rely more heavily on sources. Um, I 
tend to read a lot of academic journals. I because there aren't a lot of you know books that are non-academic published on Italian folk magic, which I'm okay with. I like reading academic sources. Um, but I tend to do a lot more research than I do like I'm vibing with this and this is correct. I think I've had a couple experiences where we'll say like call it intuition. Intuition told me to do a particular spell when I was doing workings with my ancestors and I later got confirmation that that spell is present in uh certain like families of Italian folk magic because my friend who is Italian Canadian was like we have almost the exact same spell in our family with this stuff so that's kind of where my direct experiences happen is sometimes I do things out of intuition and later I will get confirmation that that is something that is actually done or was done in Italian folk magic or maybe is present in Italian American or Italian Canadian folk magic. Um, I tend to not have as many of those experiences as I think uh, my platform thinks. I'm very, I'm very logical. I'm very research driven. And that is because um, that's how, I mean, that's how I love learning. And I don't necessarily want to do something from my intuition and then find out that it's, yeah, no, it's not at all historically accurate um, or get wrong information, historically inaccurate information. And I think being friends with like a folklorist and um, people who are very driven by reconstructing uh, old traditions has influenced the way I interact with reconnection. I try to find things that do have historical backing or traditions that existed at one point in either close to or in the region my ancestors were from. And I work based off that to reconstruct because I will never be able to completely be 100% an Italian folk practitioner because I am not just Italian. I'm also American. Um, and even then, uh, it's going to take years for me to be fully within a practice that feels like it's you know, natural and completely reconnected and working within the basis and understanding of both the traditions of Italian folk magic that my great grandmother did and my current practice. Mm. Yeah, thank you. That was yeah. a <laughs> very exhaustive answer. And why is it important for you to reconnect with your Italian heritage since you were born and raised in, in the US? I think it's important to me, I'll work from why it's important to me and why I think it's important in general. I think it's important to me because there's always, I mean, everyone wants that sense of belonging somewhere and working within a framework of reconnecting to something that has been lost or that existed in my family at some point and over generations was forgotten about is important to me. I say it's important in general because when we look at America as a whole, American culture is white supremacy for the most part. As people assimilate into America, they shed their culture, they shed their language, they shed their heritage in order to fit in as an American um, and fit into the American dream. And I think part of desettling or decolonizing is reconnecting with what has been lost and moving past the American culture that focuses on whiteness and able-bodiedness and thinness and heteronormativity and move into um, something older that has uh, was lost through assimilation or immigration. Mm. And is this also what drives you personally or... It's a really good question. I think a lot of things drive me personally, mostly love for coffee. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think that I'm a very morally bound person. I 
my hold my morals and my ethics very close to my practice, which is not what every witch does. That is not every practitioner. And there are lots of practitioners who have completely different sets of morals and ethics than I do. And I think because of the current climate in America and the way that our country is behaving and the way we are heading um, with the exhaustive list of people of color who are, you know, being killed every single day or disappearing, it is impossible for me to exist in a place of privilege with a platform and not be very um, driven by the want and the need for everyone to receive, to not be existing in like a hellscape. Does that, (laughs) and I think that's, you know, the byproduct of being raised by like parents who were more liberal leaning, who told me that I could believe whatever I want and is continued to be the byproduct of existing on the internet and seeing all of the things that have happened in the past two years that are horrible in America. And it's hard for me to not focus on that as part of my practice and as part of my existence as a person with on TikTok or on YouTube. Mm. Yeah, I really appreciate that kind of sentiment and uh, it really resonates with me. <laughs> so I, yeah, I agree. And I think that I'm, something that I noticed when I uh, try to look at, um, because this is something that I think it's very specific to uh, America and perhaps also Canada. Mm-hmm. But uh, now I'm thinking about the US and how there is, um, I, I hear so many Americans that say, oh, I'm Italian or I'm German or mm-hmm. I'm something else. Mm-hmm. Um, and what I noticed, it is just anecdotal. It's not like I, I've done research on it. But what I noticed is that nobody says I'm English, yeah. for instance. So m- sometimes my I, I thought, is it possibly connected to the, to the fact that they want to sort of... Um, distance themselves from the the settlers you know the 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 people that have colonized the country Mm -hmm. and so they're trying to set themselves apart and say i'm not one of those but i am uh, one of those migrants that arrived afterwards so that was one of the um, thoughts that came to my mind just Mm -hmm. because i never really hear people you know americans say i'm english because they have, I'm sure that many will have an English heritage, mm-hmm. uh, but it's not something that you hear, or maybe it's just my perception because I don't live in the US, I, so you can tell me whether I'm wrong. I think you're correct. I w- don't know if it's so much um, that there is an element, I think, of distancing from settlers, distancing from whiteness, um, because of, you know, we can get into, like, I could recommend so many books that talk about racial dynamics in the U.S. and white guilt and white fragility. Um, I also think part of it is that a lot of English migrants came over so long ago that it is so diluted that there's, I mean, I am, there's part of my, part of me that's English, um, there is part of me way back when that was English and came over. That's also yeah. interesting. I mean, why, for instance, you connect with the uh, Italian heritage and not the English one? <laughs> Great question. Just... It's because the most recently immigrated part of my family was Italian. I was raised with Italian American, certain Italian American customs and certain Italian American superstitions and beliefs, whereas the English heritage that I have is so far back that anything that came over is gone. And I'm talking like first colonizers of the U.S. It came over like English heritage. The other part of it is Hungarian and Austrian. And Austrian, Austrian Hungarian is part as my grandfather's um, heritage. But at the same time, his that culture was further back. And I didn't have anything of it growing up. I didn't have my grandma um, making Italian, like Austrian Hungarian food. Because the immigration of my Italian family is so close, like I think one, two, two or three generations back, versus Austrian Hungarian is about six, 
five, six back, it's further back. Um, I feel more connected to the Italian American side of me because I'm closer to it. I grew up with elements of it and I grew up with fragments of it that I don't have of the other parts that I am supposedly, which is why I'm not going to go around saying I'm Austrian Hungarian because I got absolutely nothing. I have no remnants of culture. I have no language. I had none of the customs or anything came down. None of it was transferred. Whereas I was raised going to the Feast of the Seven Fishes on Christmas Eve. So I know that to an extent some elements of Italian American culture I grew up with. Yeah, I think that it makes sense. The cultural impact that the Italian culture has had on you is mm -hmm. much heavier and more significant, more impactful on, on you as mm -hmm. and the formation of your identity. So mm -hmm. uh, I understand. Um, <laughs> So uh, thank you so much for this conversation, Frankie. So where can people find you in case they want to follow you? Yeah, I am on most platforms as Chaotic Witch Aunt. I have a YouTube channel. I have an Instagram, both under that handle. I also have a TikTok. If you really want to go find that, I don't do a lot on TikTok. I kind of just make funny videos. That's also Chaotic Witch Aunt. Um, I have a website, which is chaoticwitchant.com, which you can find information on my book, on classes, on any of the services I offer. And other than that, I kind of just hang about. I just do things. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much for uh, coming on the coming over on Angela's Symposium, Frank Frankie. And I hope it was a pleasant experience for you too. <laughs> it was wonderful. Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> yeah, and uh, all of you guys watching this video, uh, go over to um, Frankie's channel. I will put a link somewhere here uh, so that you can also watch the interview where I'm the one who's getting interviewed <laughs> <laughs> on Italian witchcraft. So I hope you watch that one as well. And uh, thank you for uh, sticking uh, up until the end <laughs> watching this video. <laughs> Sounds great. Bye. Bye. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed this interview. And if you did enjoy this interview and my other content on the academic study of all things esoteric, please consider supporting my work with a one-off PayPal donation by joining memberships or my inner symposium on Patreon, where you will get access to our Discord server, monthly lectures, and lots of other perks depending on your chosen tier. Also, please, if you like this video, don't forget to smash the like button, subscribe to the channel, activate the notification bell so that you will never miss a new upload from me, and share the video with your friends and leave me a comment. I really want to know what you thought about this conversation. And as always, stay tuned for all the academic fun. Bye for now. <laughs>